Uh, you know, our next guest, he's with the NFL Network, terrific career at Penn State, seventh overall pick back in 1993. He's going to help us break down the wide receivers that uh, will be going tonight and, and certainly into tomorrow as well. Uh, some of the names that most people are familiar with. Good career, Curtis Conway, and he's with us here on Tiki and Tierney, CBS Sports Radio. Curtis, hey, Ben, bud, what's happening? I'm good. What's going on? And, fellas, I'm sorry I got too much pride in my school to accept that I'm from Penn State. <laughs> ah, <laughs> all right. Well, let, all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, listen, I mean, hey, well, let's, let's start with Hackenberg then. You know, I wasn't necessarily going to go here. I, what happened to this kid? You know what? Man, it, it, it's funny. I think probably when you look at the coaching changes, you know, a lot of these guys, today go to school because of, the, because of the system, the coach, and that's a huge part of uh, why they make those choices. And all of a sudden that coach leaves to go to a different team and they don't buy into the next guy and they really don't maximize their potential. So that's the only thing I can see, a guy that had that much success early on and all of a sudden there's changes made and he starts to fall off a little bit. Yeah, you know, when you think about the quarterbacks in, in, in the National Football League and – Obviously, you, you haven't played. Is it? I mean, is it is it a reach to go get a quarterback, or or is it something that's so necessary that you have to take the chance? I think it's a reach, and I think we in the media we over uh, publicize the quarterback because I think we have to try to sell something in the media. If defense and running backs don't sell, quarterbacks do. Yeah. And so I think teams feel like we have to go out and get a quarterback because in everybody's mind that is what you need to win the Super Bowl. And I disagree with that. I'm still old school. I think you need defense in the running game, and I think the running game helps the quarterback out so much. But I think we've fallen into this whole thing with Tom Brady and Peyton Manning and Drew Brees. You know, it's kind of like the Michael Jordan days. Everybody felt they had to go get the next Michael Jordan. Well, no, it's only one Michael Jordan. And when you look at basketball, Pop has, Popovich has showed that, look, you can win without having – the big superstar, it still comes down to team. And I think that's what the league has to get back to, understanding this is a team game and build your team versus giving up everything to go get a quarterback who may not be successful. But I think they feel like if we show that we're going after a quarterback, it shows we're trying to win. Yeah. And for me, I just don't buy into that. Yeah, isn't there so much? I mean, cause I, I, I rail on this a lot, Curtis, because of the – the money that's associated with it, right? There's no middle ground for quarterbacks and money. You're either paying them nothing or you're paying them the world. Uh, it doesn't exist for other other positions, right? The running backs, they we struggle just to get, you know, $7 million a year. Quarterbacks, you can give them, you know, 30 at this point. Um, so I wonder if that creates a, I don't know, a an over-expectation in the locker rooms and a, man, you're making so much money, you're not even balling. You know, that, that type of situation that can often be disruptive to teams. So it's, is it really worth it to go get the guy that you have to pay and he's not going to be as effective as you want, you know, his, his, his salary dictates? Well, I think, you, I think you hit it on the nose because people forget there's players in the locker room that have true emotions and feelings and, and they're trying to win games. And like you said, anytime you go break the bank on a guy that you think is going to go – and, and make something happen, and he doesn't, trust me, that trickles through the locker room. Players just can't come out and be honest because they're not being team players, but trust me, and you know as well as anyone, in a locker room you will hear that talk, and it does divide a locker room because players know we don't just need this. We need multiple pieces to win, and with the emphasis being so much on the quarterback, I mean, you think about it. you got quarterbacks getting paid a lot of money in today's game, and had, hadn't even proven anything, but because the quarterback is available, everyone feels we got to go get a quarterback, and because of the market that Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, the guy that earned the money, has set the bar so high, everybody's just getting market value that don't deserve it. All right, I'm an absolute idiot. I mean, I listen, I, I just can't let this fly anymore. We're talking to Curtis Conway, uh, seventh overall pick back in 93. Kurt, I have no idea why, I, I, for some reason... And thank God I have enough confidence that I say a few things right every day to call myself out for being a complete knucklehead. Why the hell I said Penn State? I have no idea. You know idea. why? Because in the I break, don't know. You know why? Because in the break we were talking about Christian Hackenberg. Ah, there maybe. You there you that, go. That's why. So it was on our minds. So that was hey, dopey. Ah, I hear you, man. And so I appreciate being cool with that. And I look back at the draft, right? And, Teak, how about these names rattled in succession after Curtis? It was pretty good himself. Willie Rofe, mm. phenomenal old lineman. 
Lincoln Kennedy, outstanding, and the bus, back to back to back, uh, just a few spots after Curtis from, from, from uh, USC. And I know the draft days change quite a bit. You aren't from the Stone Age, you're our generation, but 1993, very different than 2015 or 2016. How did you find out when you got, where were you when you got the call? What was your draft day experience like, Curtis? Well, it was, it was pretty incredible because I actually uh, I got invited to New York, but I wanted to spend it at home with my grandmother because she uh, she couldn't get to New York. So uh, it was cool because I was able to stay home, and the cameras came to my grandmother's house, and we had a bunch of family over and people that, uh, that helped me get to that point. It was good to be able to share that moment. And it was amazing um, that the Bears called me right around at the right around like after the sixth pick. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you take all these different uh, visits to these teams throughout this process, and I visit Chicago, but they didn't follow up. I didn't hear from Chicago much after that, so that was the last team I thought was going to draft me. And all of a sudden I get the call from Chicago, and it just it, it just kind of caught me off guard at first. You know, of course you're overwhelmed and you're happy, but he's like, wow. This was the last team I thought was going to pick me. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're so pumped up, man. You're just ready to get going and yeah. get to your new city and play. Was your grandma, did she live long enough to see you play a little bit in the NFL? Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. You know, it was amazing because she got healthy enough to actually come and watch me play in Chicago. Uh-huh. So that was pretty cool. That's you know? awesome, man. Yeah. This is an interesting crop of wide receivers. I don't particularly like it. You know, uh, and listen, I – I know Treadwell is on most people's board uh, as the top wide out. To me, he's a half a step slow. Doesn't mean he can't be, you know, really good, but he's obviously has a speed deficiency. Will Fuller uh, dropped the ball a lot, even though he's a burner. It seems uh, Coleman only ran about three or four routes at Baylor. It seems like every wide receiver has a little, you know, warning tag next to their name. Uh, break it down. Who do you like and who are you worried about the next level? Uh, you know, I agree. Um, I think all of these guys have something, but I think most receivers do. Um, they, for me, a receiver coming into the league, it all comes down to the system that they're in. And you see a lot of guys that are highly, uh, you know, talked about are going to be first and second round. Sometimes they pan out and sometimes they don't. Uh, in this particular draft, I actually let Josh Dotson. To me, he's the most, when you look at the full package, he's not, a burner, but he's not slow. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not big, but he's not small. He can catch the ball, and he, he's kind of like that prototype in, in height and weight. Uh, but no one really separates themselves like we saw last year with Kevin White and Amari Cooper. We don't have that in this year's draft. So, you know, it, 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 it definitely, I agree with you. No one's talking about one guy out of the bunch being a stud in the league. Doesn't mean that they won't be. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think, too, you have to look at the, the way college has become such a passive league. Uh, and I don't think we're shocked anymore. You know, somebody catching 100 balls, there's nothing anymore. So it still comes down to what you do in the league. I think you have more respect for a receiver that's putting up big numbers in a pro-style offense in college versus an air raid offense. And I just think you're seeing a lot of guys now put up the numbers to where it's like, okay, you, you guys are playing in this air raid system. I'm not impressed anymore. Yeah, you know, last question for you here. Curtis, we saw Denard Robinson make the transition from that athletic quarterback at Michigan to running back at Jacksonville. What do you think Braxton Miller is going to be like as a pro? Again, you know, it all comes down to system and how someone uses him. I mean, if he goes to a pro-style offense and he's asked to be the guy, you know, who knows if he's going to have that much success. But, you know, you take Randall L. from back in the day yep. where he was able to get in that slot and was able to be used properly to be successful. Um, it all depends. I, as a receiver, I've been in situations where I wanted to go in the slot because I saw that I could have a lot of success in there versus when you're out there on the island, it's easy to be taken out as a speed guy keeping the safety over top. Now the quarterback is not even looking your way. So I've always said this, a receiver, it comes down to two things. Quarterback trusting you because you're not going to always get wide open. You're going to have to trust that you can make a play. And a coach that's able to maximize you and move you around to help you be successful. That's what it comes down for me because I just think that the receiver position, it's not a huge gap. Like, you know, Randy Moss, guys like that was just special. But Mm -hmm. I think everybody else kind of fits in this box and it all comes down to how you use them. 
Curtis Conway's a proud Trojan. He's a proud Trojan. There you go. <laughs> NFL Network analyst. He's on Twitter, of course, at Curtis Conway 80. And uh, all the coverage, NFL Network. You guys do a great job. Live from Chicago tonight and throughout. Curtis, good stuff, man. We'll talk to you soon. Anytime, guys. Appreciate it. Be good, Curtis. Appreciate you as well. All right.